morning, Remley. You're from a sixth form college in the Midlands. That's right. I'm principal of King Edward VI College, uh, just outside of Birmingham, and we are an A-level specialist college, delivering nothing but A-levels. And you're going to talk to us today about the government's policy um, on linear A-levels, where the previous two courses have now been changed into a single two-year linear qualification and how you practically have implemented that within the college. Well, I can tell you it, it, that was a tremendous challenge, partly because the previous system of modular A-levels was really quite popular with both teachers and also with students. So here we were faced with um, the challenge of trying to effectively implement the linear A-levels, which I, I think quite a number of people had a, a, a reservations about, um, to put it simply. And I have to say that um, when I began to approach this, I just started really with looking at what are my educational values, what is the vision of the college itself, and how can I make sure that the way we approach the implementation of the new linear A levels remains true to that educational vision. And in fact, that's really how I approach all policy that may, may come my way as principal. And so I always start with the two things that are at the core of the educational mission. And in some ways I view this as my moral contract with, with students and um, with myself as an educator. And it is to make sure that every student who walks through my door will leave with um, and improved outcomes of, of, of one sort or another, but that that's all done, and this is the second important thing, that that's all done within a very high quality learning experience which serves to develop the student both personally and academically. So the challenge really for me was, as the leader, was to be able to take this, this new initiative in terms of delivering the curriculum in a linear way and make sure that I remained true to both of those those values um, and in some ways it, it was easy because I believe that to develop the whole person you need to maximize your time learning rather than spending time on assessment. And how do you feel that has impacted within the College of your authenticity as the leader? Well I think that um, the first challenge that I had was really to make sure that I didn't stay at a kind of theoretical level talking about how we're implementing the policy in terms of the values. That was the framework that I used in terms of implementation, but it was really important for me to listen to the teachers and to hear the challenges that they felt that they were experiencing in terms of being in the classroom and having to deliver this. Now, the reason I say that is because, first of all, many of the teachers themselves had not grown up in a linear model. So they had quite a learning journey to go on themselves about how do you then deliver the curriculum in this, this new format that they hadn't experienced themselves, let alone taught themselves. And the second thing was knowing that um, students were going, some students were going to face quite a few challenges in terms of a terminal assessment at the end of a two-year journey. So it was really important for me to listen to them to know that it isn't just about the curriculum delivery model. It would also be about, in order to make sure we stay true to every student coming out with an improved outcome, that we were able to support the students throughout that two-year journey, making sure that we identify when they began, uh, some of them, when if they were underachieving, being able to identify what interventions would be appropriate, putting in really bespoke support. And the key thing is that for a teacher who may face up to 200 students, uh, this is a really hard challenge. They have increased workloads and it was important that we listen to them and figure out how we can make our systems work for them so that they were enabled to be able to deliver this new curriculum uh, and staying true to the high quality experience we want our students to have. Hello John, um, you're from a quite different type of institution from mine, aren't you? Uh, yeah, good morning. I'm John Laramie, the principal at Exeter College, which is a genuine tertiary college uh, and effectively the sixth form uh, for the city of Exeter. And, and John, I know that you've been working on um, really how you implement value-added, the whole value-added metric system within your college. 
Uh, yeah, uh, that's been, been quite a change uh, for us. So uh, we were very focused previously on achievement and uh, the new value added agenda has been, been quite a big change for us. So we've done a number of things, uh, updated governors, uh, we made a, one of our senior leadership team accountable, uh, launched a three year strategy, appointed uh, a champion within the college to, to lead on this. Uh, then crucially, we engaged our staff in choosing the right value added methodology. Uh, and the staff really, really got involved uh, and interested in that. Then in terms of measurement, we've looked at uh, how we include value added in the self-assessment process. So give an increased weighting, if you like, to uh, how subjects are performed in terms of value added at the end of the year. Uh, and then to support staff, we've created systems, processes, so that they get lots of information on how young people are doing and things that we could improve. So that's how you practically implemented um, the use of value-added uh, metrics. But how do you feel that that whole process impacted upon you in terms of your authenticity as a, an, a leader in FE? Yeah, I, I was very passionate about making sure that all young people stay uh, to the end of their programme and, and get a grade. So for me, uh, it was trying to take that uh, in the context of an outstanding college. Uh, one of the things that, that I feel it, my role is, is to try and make sure that we, to, to use the Wayne, Wayne Gretzky uh, quote, uh, to make sure the college skates to where the puck's going to be. So it felt that this was the new way of being measured. So uh, part of my value set was to make sure that staff then are aware uh, of the new way that colleges are measured and the performance is measured. So uh, that seemed to go quite well. We communicated carefully. And, and I've got to be honest, I think as long as you do the right thing for young people, then you tend not to go far wrong. And if you put young people's achievements as your core, uh, the core of your value set, uh, you tend to end up in the right place. So I guess your starting point was really what was right for the students rather than starting point in terms of the the actual policy you were having to implement. Yeah, it was. And um, we also looked at how we could engage young people in that policy right from the start with assemblies so that young people at the start of the year uh, get the expectation that they can really do well uh, at the college. Thanks very much. Diane, you're from a similar college to me, but a little bit closer to the coast. Yes, I'm Diane Grinnell. Um, I'm principal of Bournemouth and Poor College, so we're a large GFE right on the south coast. And Diane, uh, funding cuts have been a, a real challenge uh, for the sector, so how have you practically managed that? As you say, John, um, funding cuts have been a huge challenge for the sector and continue to be so. Um, we've been in a, a situation for uh, eight years now where we haven't seen a rise in our funding rates and I think probably at first um, the funding squeeze was seen as a fairly helpful impetus um, that led to changes and efficiencies that perhaps in some cases were overdue. Um, I think now eight years down the line we are in a situation where it's very different and they are becoming hugely damaging on a variety of levels. Um, but obviously it's my job to promote um, all our cost saving initiatives in a positive light um, to all of our staff to persuade them to accept changes and, and uh, all the things that we need to do. How we've gone about that? Well we started I'm sure like everybody else um, by targeting what we call the low hanging fruit and I think some of the things we did in the early years were perhaps um, even welcomed by staff and, and didn't really require a, a justification but a few years in um, the funding cuts certainly did start to bite um, and we responded to that by um, two things. We, we talked to our staff, we explained the need, um, what was happening in the sector. We were very sensible and rational and logical in our explanations um, about what we were doing to protect the long-term interest of the institution and therefore the students and the staff that, that, that are in there. Um, and the second thing is that we tried very hard to prioritise um, and look at the things we wanted to protect, which was mainly around teaching and learning. So inevitably that meant that um, our first really big hard hits um, did fall to our business support areas. Um, and in fact, we even put our biggest support departments into a shared service. So I think in the early years, our approach was very much around um, logic and ration, uh, rationale um, in terms of how we took staff with us. And, and Diane, how did you manage this alongside your authenticity as a leader? 
I think it's, it was really difficult and I think for me the seminal moment came one day um, when a member of staff turned around and said to me, yes, but what are you doing about funding cuts? Um, and I realised at that moment that actually, um, although staff want me to protect the organisation, to take all the right decisions, to um, to secure a long-term future, they also wanted to see that I was angry and that I was doing something to articulate the anger that all of staff feel um, in FE. Um, and so now um, I take care not only to talk to them about the, the context, but I also make sure that I take time to explain to them about the things that we're doing um, to express our anger. So I explain to them about the work that the AOC do to lobby, um, to influence policy. And I also um, tell them whenever I meet with MPs or I write letters um, so that they can see that there is some positive action being taken on behalf um, of them and, and their students. And the second thing that we've tried to do is to put something back and there are things that you can do, even, even when times are hard, um, to make staff feel better. So we've um, initiated a programme of employee engagement. Um, and so we take time now to look at how we can reward staff um, in different ways, um, how we can manage talent. And all of those things are starting, I think, to feel um, with staff that, um, that there is something going back um, that, that, that may not be costing anything, but shows that they are still valued. Um, even in, in, a, in a time when we're perhaps having to make other colleagues redundant. Thank you very much. Good morning, Clive. You're principal of um, a large general FE college on the south coast of England. I am. Yes, thank you, Di. So, yep, just to confirm, I'm Clive Cook and I am the principal of Sussex Coast College currently and we're just about to merge with a neighbouring college uh, and I'm taking over the uh, principal's role of that. And you're going to talk today um, about the government's policy on English and maths and how you have practically implemented that in your college. Yeah, thanks Di. Uh, yes, I guess so like all colleges then, we have found English and maths, particularly around GCSEs, quite challenging. So uh, with a number of mistakes under our belt, I'm happy just to talk through some of the key things that we've done. Um, so first of all then, with the benefit of hindsight and lessons, we've briefed all our people, uh, all our English and Maths uh, and uh, uh, other teachers on the importance of English and Maths and resits in particular. Um, these included a personal belief that I've got that English and Maths is important for 16 to 18 year olds, although I think there's some con some controversy around whether 16 to 18 should be required to do the resits for GCSE or whether they could do their functional skills. Nonetheless, we briefed all our people on the importance of English and Maths. We had it incoherent at one point, so we've brought English and Maths together under one director who is accountable for the learning assessment and teaching of all English and Maths teachers and student success and uh, this particular post in turn invested heavily in CPD for all of our English and Maths teachers and all of our vocational and academic teachers that were required to promote English and Maths in their mainstream lessons uh, and also to include it as well. And we took a, uh, a dual approach in terms of performance I've already said that we invested heavily in CPD, but also we didn't shy away from performance with those colleagues that didn't deliver to a good or better standard. And we did say goodbye to a fair number of English and maths teachers during the early stages. And I'm just thinking of maths, for example, at one point, we uh, said goodbye to 60% of our maths teachers. Have we got it fully sorted? No. Are we on the way to getting it sorted? Yes. And I think we've got our priorities lined up in the right order. And how have you balanced introducing what's been a controversial government policy with your own personal value set? Yeah, that's a good question, really. Um, so my personal view is that English and maths is critical, or are critical rather, and therefore all 16 to 18 year olds should have it to the best of their ability. I suppose what I struggle with a bit is the requirement for those students that have got a grade D 
to do the reset in GCSE English and Maths. Uh, I would be comfortable for them to do uh, functional skills. However, that's the policy and we've got to get on with it. So the way that I've reconciled it is to accept that as the CEO and the principal, I can't have it all my own way all of the time. And I think typical of any leader at any level in any organisation, there will be policies and things that I don't personally agree with. But on those occasions, that's the policy, that's the statute, that's the whatever, and I've, get, and I've got to get on with it. So I've balanced it by accepting that I need a pragmatic way forward. It isn't up for debate, and therefore we've taken our people with us. Thank you very much, Clive.